What's up, folks? Hey, Peter, Jake. I'm in Utah. Jake's in California. And we're talking about the 40 Matters and Seahawks on a Friday because they played on a Thursday. And uh, as per usual, the 49ers and Seahawks played a ridiculous football game. Just Correct. normalcy was not allowed. And I think we're all thankful for that because it was wildly entertaining, even if it was exceptionally stressful for those with an invested uh, team in the contest. Uh, Jake, uh, initial takeaways, I mean, they won by the margin. I think we both thought they'd win. We thought that they would handle them. They just didn't really handle them. But well, right. <laughs> when you have a little bit of time here to to digest it, what what stands out to you from Thursday night's game? It's funny because like Fred Warner admitted, you know, someone asked him like, D- "Did you think it was going to go sort of the same way as the Cardinals, and the Rams?" He's like, "Yeah, a thousand percent." <laughs> He's like, "Yeah, it really felt like that." But you know, we held on, um, and they basically held on because Geno Smith threw a terrible interception. Yeah. Uh, to Renardo Green, who made a great play on it and had like pretty good coverage on that play, but like terrible from Gino. Also, uh, I didn't want to put it on Twitter, but I thought it the whole game, and every Seahawks fan seems to agree with me. DK Metcalf is their third best receiver. Um, like, I don't know. Jake Bobo is pretty good, man. Like, we might point. be fourth. You think about some of the plays that were had in that game. There's just a, he's not he's not good at wide receiving, and I'm not sure if that means they should convert him to a quasi tight end or a fly. I don't know what's going on there, and ultimately that's not really our problem. Not to say that we couldn't do three and a half hours on what the hell's going on with DK Metcalf and it wouldn't be fun right. and entertaining and insightful. Just like there's something way off there, and yeah. uh, it worked to the Niners' benefit. Seahawks fans are over it. I mean, he throws every every game they've played over the last what three years. He's thrown a tantrum, and yeah, almost every game I watch him, he throws a tantrum on the sideline. Like you're way too big, so bad, Jake, to be reacting so like bad. that. Like, and then he's like, the, the quote he gave to the sideline reporter, where he's like, "I just, you know, whatever, you know, it's just I. We just need to go make plays." And it's like this was after he was targeted on three straight plays and didn't make any. Like, yeah. I'm sorry, you need you need to be winning those and. I think Smith and Jigba is their best receiver. Uh, I think yeah. Lenore did a heck of a job in this yeah. game. Uh, really, really, really good. I thought Mustafa looked great until he came out. Um, R.I.P. He, he, some... he looked outstanding. He fires. I mean, he plays with a violence that's going to pop, right? Like, it, that's not um, – that's something that when you don't have the All-22, you're thinking that he might be the greatest safety of all time. I'm watching right. the All-22. I mean, say what you will about Amazon. And I said a lot last night about just how garbage their game production is to the point where the Niners don't get the ball off of what should have been a clear turnover because Amazon's game production is so bad. Uh, Regardless, they do give you the all 22 film for the game and I'm watching it. And Mustafa was monstrous, just absolutely monstrous in that contest. And uh, really I think gave the Niners with him and Jair Brown a one-two punch at safety that felt for the first time like, hey, they could not just make the playoffs but win in the playoffs with those two guys. And this is the part of the show where I say safeties are destiny. Here is where I think the Niners are at. Like starting from the defense, and I made this point in my column last night, is that you have a situation where this is a young defense it has a lot of inexperience and a lot of pieces that are new. And yeah. it's not quite right yet. You've got Fred Warner playing at an all-world level. You've got Nick Bosa, who he didn't have a sack last night. But you awesome. look at you look at um, that first Geno completion to DK where he had 30 yards. If Bosa doesn't pressure him there, it's actually a touchdown because I think it's Smith and Jigbo yeah. is wide open on the other side of the field. He was. And then the interception Mustafa has – Bose is collapsing the pocket. He just destroyed Stone Forsyth, which is something we expected and pointed out going into this game, just a rough side of the offensive line for Seattle. Yeah, third, you, third right tackle for them. Right. But you basically, you've got Warner, you've got Bosa, and Malik Collins doing a pretty pretty darn good job too. Malik Collins had an immense first half and uh, faded. He faded in the second. We can call yeah. it like it is. And I like Stone Forsyth sounds like something I did today at at Zion National Park. That's not a viable right right tackle in the NFL. 
my my Seahawks uh, friend is like, I'm not sure he's a real person, but he's out there because George Fant and uh, Abe Lucas are just he's he's the forever. Robert Beal. The Robert Beal actually, I I must note, had a uh, a plays. false start. Whether it was on a punt or a, 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 a he had some sort of special teams false start to the point where I go, who's 50 again? Oh, right, Robert Beal. But he did have a really nice defensive play. I think it was in the third yeah. quarter of that game, which is the yeah, first time did. I've ever said that. I agree. I agree. He made a play. Um, yeah. But I, I think that's emblematic and, and that's of where the Robert this, Beal corner. I think that's emblematic of where this defense is, right? You've got a lot of new guys, a lot of sort of random guys. You can't trust Evandre Campbell. I think this is a setting up for a situation where they – might bench him for D Winters. And I think whatever you lose in terms of run fits is probably worth it because Winters is such an upgrade in terms of speed and, and coverage. And like that first Metcalf 30 yarder, that's all on Campbell. And now it's two games in a row where these are just bust by him where he can't cover. He, his body isn't keeping up with his mind, even if his mind is quick enough, which it's not showing that it is. And so I think where you're at is you've got a defense that with Mustafa and Green. And even Okuanu and some of the other guys, there are some young pieces there that I think you give them enough time, they can round into form. They've shown flashes, but it's not going to be there right away. And so that's why I think they're in these second halves, they're like almost throwing it away because you need the offense to put the pedal down and drive the ball and put it in the end zone. And last year they were able to do that. And this year without McCaffrey, they're struggling. Shanahan is is still trying to find his thing. Like I haven't been overly Im- impressed with him and, and some of what he's dialed up. Um, but I think you get into a situation now where Ricky Pearsall is coming back to practice. You get him in the fold. He might not. Shanahan said he might not come back this week. Uh, I kind of think if he's kinda looking good to. in practice, he should. Otherwise, yeah. you're waiting until the bye, and then you bring him back, which is reasonable. But like, well, I mean, yeah, I suppose you could do. I suppose you could do Dallas the week after. But like, if you're giving deference to the again fact that there is a mental health aspect of this right. that can't be judged on a practice field, giving that deference and just presuming, rightfully or not, that everything's okay there by the basis of he's playing football. Then yeah, if he looks good in practice, you have to play him. You have to play him against Kansas City, because Jake. I mean, I, I, I don't think we need to toot our own horn here much. Those who are here know what we're about, and that we don't get them all right. But we nailed this game from thousands of miles away, and we've nailed it because we, we see what other teams are doing, and it's not terribly complicated. It's pretty clear. And guess what? They're copying the team that's coming to town a Sunday from now. And you don't think they're going to do this? I mean, maybe. Yeah, you know what? Say what you will about Specs. He might mix it up. He might do something different. He might just decide to fuck with Kyle at a level beyond anything that Kyle's ever been fucked with before. But, like, they're probably just going to play a bunch of man-to-man, win with Chris Jones in the middle, and uh, and, and, yeah. and do exactly what they did in the Super Bowl again. In which case, you're going to need a man-to-man beater beyond Brandon Ayuk because Brock simply does not look over there, which is something we'll get into a little bit later on in the show. And we've talked about all year long, really glaring yesterday. Ricky Pearsall's a man beater. At least he should be a man beater. And at least a man, like he's going to test it. He's he's going to stress it in a way that yeah. Debo can't. How much do you think Debo's injury is affecting him? I know that's like the world's worst sports talk radio topic, but it, it, he has. I kind of went back. I was looking at uh, week one, week two. It was fine wasn't special he's only broken maybe two tackles now three tackles this season came into the game with one yeah. um did he break a tackle on the 76 yarder yes i don't know about that. um regardless uh, th- then we're getting into the the, the nitty gritty on what a broken tackle is I, he didn't strike me as spry yesterday either didn't i thought he looked me. better but okay. not i mean granted it was 100 did he look better or was he used better i do think there's a difference it's a great question and I'm not sure I I have a clear answer. I think he was used better. I think Kyle used him better. At the same time, I I just I don't see the burst. I don't see the power that he used to have. So I don't think how I don't think you can be too concerned if you're the 49ers about oh well then we might have to take Debo off the field for Ricky Pearsall. Like 
Right. Yes, that's probably a stretch, but I wouldn't be too. I wouldn't be too stressed about that right now. In fact, I think that fewer snaps might do Debo Samuel some good, given how he's looked so far. It's the point I feel like we made at the start of the season. And by the way, the 49ers, another thing we previewed is like they have been running the fourth fewest play action in the league. And we're like short week game, you know, against the defense that got you. They're going to probably go to play action. They ran it seven times. They actually ran it more than that. But when yep. when the NFL's tracking it, it doesn't count when Purdy scrambles. There were like right. two or three other times they ran play action. So they actually ran it more than seven times. And even if you just count those seven out of 29, that's 24%. They've been running it like 16, 17% on yeah. the year. The lowest they've ever run it with Kyle. And lo and behold, they run play action, get back to their basics, which when you don't have a man beater running back, you kind of have to get back to. And it worked pretty well. And not just that. They ran it from under center, which is yep. sounds ridiculous. We're talking about a Kyle Shanahan Kubiak offense here, and we're like, wow, so innovative, going right back to the basic premise of the offense, which is stretch outside run zones and then making sure that you can get the boot off of that, off play action, so that you can get guys and put linebackers in conflict. And yep. 17 for Seattle. Baker was just spinning yesterday. And I thought Brock looked really good when he was under center. And I understand that you have the franchise quarterback and you want to give him the opportunity to put his stamp on the offense. You want to have a collaboration. That's not what this team was built to do. The Brock Purdy offense. The Brock Purdy offense requires guys who can win in man-to-man. You built a team five, six years ago, it should be noted, around a bunch of guys who destroy in zone and destroy when the middle of the field is wide open because of strong play action boot concepts. So this four or five wide bullshit, which I do think has certainly a place in the league, and I do think Brock Purdy is actually pretty good at it. He's on the San Francisco 49ers. And I get that they're trying to evolve and they're trying to change things up and they bring in Pearsall and they bring in Cowing and they're trying to do more stuff, but they just signed Brandon and I to a $30 million contract. Yes, he can beat man, but again, brought in under a different conceit. He, he was Jimmy Garoppolo was his quarterback before that. Debo Samuel, Jimmy Garoppolo was his quarterback. Juwan Jennings on his second contract was brought in when Jimmy Garoppolo, Trey Lance were the quarterback. This team was built, George Kittle, George Kittle, who has been irreplaceable for this team not just this year though it is glaring this year but over several years now like he's good in no matter what scheme you're going to run he is otherworldly in the actual scheme that Kyle Shanahan has run his entire career and decided to get away from this year I'm totally with you like back to basics don't leave stick with the basics because they were too cute by way more than half for the first five, six games of this season. And I think the two best games they've played this year, and I'll throw it on the defensive side too, the two best games they've played this year, Jets yesterday. In those two games, they were at their simplest, right? We're going to pound the rock. We got a running back who can run. Can't do anything else, but he he can't pass protect it. He can't catch it, but he He can can, He can catch it in when he's open in space, but like Like he's not a receiving back. You're right. He's an he's a very high caliber NFL player. Like yes, he right. has, you know, it's it's not a Ronnie Bell like situation. But uh, and by the way, you know, he's injured, so who's to say anymore? But uh, it, 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 there is there is something to be said for the 49ers' two best games coming when they were at their most simple on offense, and I would argue their most simple on defense. I don't have the tracking numbers in front of me. I'm just going off of my notes from yesterday's game. Didn't seem like Nick Sorensen was dialing up too many weird, funky things. Every now and again, you'd see Lenore come in. Every now and again, Fred would stand in the A gap and make him think. That was some basic cover three, cover four, 49ers defense. And was it perfect? No, but one touchdown for Seattle was, you know, a special teams one. And I thought that, you know, they, they forced turnovers. That's the kind of defense that you've come to expect from the 49ers over the years. And Again, I think they did the exact same thing against the Jets, and it worked great. And they kind of got a little too weird in the games against Minnesota and the Rams. 
and certainly against Arizona this past week. And even, I would argue, in the Patriots one, though it didn't burn them in the ass. I I, I think basics are, are great for this team. Yeah, I, I, I'm with you. I'm with you. I think we laid this out. They even went with two tight ends, which is something I also threw out there. Not Huge. a lot, but like went back to it a little bit. Week and, one again, right? And it's something where it's like foundationally, I know the, the Shanahan thing, it always evolves, it always evolves, it adds things. But when you lose a piece that was part of your evolution and you try and continue that evolution, it just doesn't work. Like you have to yeah. actually take a step back, I think, and go, okay. okay, this is the personnel we have. Here's what's working. Here's what's not. And I think Kyle's still figuring that out. And I think it's pretty hard to, to like adjust when you were like, I'm the best, we're the best offense the world has ever seen last year, you know, right. with Christian McCaffrey. And then yeah. you you try and run the same stuff. You're like, oh, this is not working at all. Granted, maybe should have expected that, but like it takes time to sort of figure stuff out. And Kyle's adjusting maybe a little slowly, but I, you saw what happened yesterday. We talk all the time about the, the skill position players, all the stars that this Niners team have. It does not flip and matter if your offensive line can't protect. I don't care how many stars you – okay, so, like, you don't have Christian McCaffrey. That's going to change some stuff. Debo Samuel can't separate – he's never been able to separate man-to-man, but, like, let's be very clear. Like, it's it's really bad this year. It's been bad for the last – well, since January, since late December. I don't know what – the shoulder thing happened. He hasn't been able to get away from anybody. I saw Antoine Griezmann, who plays soccer, lock him up in a YouTube video. I'm not even half joking. Look it up. I'm, I'm dead serious. Like it, I saw Griezmann, the video he, too. It's hilarious. It's it, it, you can't unsee it either. Well, Jake, Debo so. makes a face where he's like, "That's actually really good coverage." <laughs> <laughs> this guy could play for the Chiefs. And then Be you know fair, yeah. we're ad nauseum with the Jennings thing. But when you don't have McCaffrey, McCaffrey makes everything work because McCaffrey. It, it's a it's a McCaffrey centric offense. He is the sun. Everything revolves around him, and a defense has no answer. To anything that he can do when he's not there guess what you have to run a goddamn scheme yeah Here, so and, when, and it's hard to run a scheme when you don't have a good offensive line so maybe make the scheme scheme simpler but you, you, that's what right. i want to get into right i i think the core of the dysfunction is one you lose mccaffrey but two the interior of this offensive line is a really big problem and i think in the run game they started to get a little bit more. They weren't totally consistent, but I saw some plays where I'm like, okay, Burford or, or Brendel got second Brendel. level, yeah. sealed that, did well. Uh, Banks is really, really struggling. He's really, yes. I think he's not right because, Clearly. listen, I, I I don't think Banks is an all-world player, even close to it, but like this is the worst I've seen him play by far. And the calf thing, he's coming off, it looks cr- like it's, It's bad. And so I want to give him a little bit of a benefit of the doubt there because it's he doesn't look right. And he's been a couple games now, though. It's been a couple. games. It's fair. It's fair. And he's had had good. He's had good games this year. I don't know when the calf thing started, but the last two games in particular, maybe three. But I'm with you. Like, look, like just going through a few of these drives. First drive of the game, red zone, second and seven. Pooney gets beat. Ayuk's open on an out route, but Purdy can't throw it because he's got someone in, in his face. Next route, Banks gets destroyed by Hankins. Destroyed. And then Kittle can't get to Dodson. And then there's an immediate pressure on play action because uh, Pooney pulls and Brendel can't make the block. That's the first yeah. two drives of the game. Offensive line breakdowns. Um, the next one, the third drive, there's the protections wrong. It's actually just not even their fault. It's a great, great call for McDonald where he yeah. shows he shows seven and then stacks four on one side. He's yeah. They, I love how when he the, does that. When the but by Seahawks the way, it burned him. Get humming. It burned him on the Debo play. It burned him because they, you know, that when you're stacking over, you're going to let a defensive end go into the flat, and then you're saying you have to trust Jordan Love, not Jordan Love. What's his name? Right, Jordan Julian Love. Julian Love. Julian Love. Thank you. You have to trust Julian Love to be there, and he wasn't there. Seventy six yards later, touchdown. Yeah. Purdy, by the way, that was like a super dangerous ball. And like on it was funny is because if he if that wasn't a bad ball, it's not a touchdown. Like it actually had to be that bad for love to miss yeah. the tackle, which is yeah. the funniest thing about it. But just to like even Trent, Trent actually got beat by Leonard Williams pretty badly in the red yeah. zone. That's what set up that second and eleven in the red zone. Cause right. Leonard Williams beats Trent Williams 
like clean and stuffs Garendo. And it's a second 11. And then Banks gets beat badly. IU comes yeah. open. Um, this is on what, the Debo, second or the, the third drive. Yeah. This is, or this is yeah. drive number four. And then four. the third and 11, you know, Banks can't get to uh, Baker on that screen to Juice. And Brendel right. is pulling probably going to be a touchdown or very close to it for juice if banks gets there he holds too long under his first assignment so there's like and there's more plays like there's more plays Brendel holds and sets up a, there's a bunch of o-line breakdowns and so that's all the setup brock has happy feet he is yeah. dancing around in the pocket and i just want to show an example that i think is emblematic of where this this offense is right now so Here's what I'm pulling up. Um, this is a play where he actually gets it complete to Jennings, and it's it's gonna be a, a nice yeah. first down complete. But I'll, I'll rewind it for for those who are listening. Basically, what yeah. happens is Brock. You might remember. Bail- you might remember the Jennings catch. He just stood in one place. It was the best scramble drill I've seen the Niners run, where Jennings is just like, I guess yeah. I'll just stand here. Basically, the pocket is clean, and so Brock. What he does is he sort of panics, and Ayuk Ayuk on the right is open. It's a t- it'd be a tight window throw. The corner yeah. is sort of sitting, and he's in between. But like yeah. Brock can make that throw and has made that throw, and Ayuk has enough separation where he can make that throw. But had no Brock, problem throwing that ball to George Kittle later in the game. Right, but Brock right there, he's got he's got a throw to Ayuk, mm-hmm. and he feels a little bit of pressure on the right, feels a little bit on the left. And Purdy just jumps up. He he jumps yeah. back. He runs around. He scurries around, and he ends up making a play. And he ends up making a really good play. But like well, Jennings, also dangerous. Jennings was open. He stayed open, and he just didn't move. And he waited for somebody to do something. And right. Brock finally found him. And but you'll you, see it on, totally on the right. second this is crazy dancing. Yeah, and you'll see it. Like the pocket's actually clear. The pocket's actually it's clear. And, pocket. and this is this is Jimmy G level. But Brock yeah. can move. Like that's what right. we would rip Jimmy Garoppolo for. And right. I think it's something where that is where the offense is. Brock, he has felt the need to play make more because one, teams are playing man to man and it's harder for players to get open. That's a yeah. factor. Two, he doesn't have time to 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 look. He is he, Brock has time to look at one side of the field and make a decision. And he does not have time to come across the other side of the field when there's often a guy open. And often that guy is Brandon Ayuk, who, in my view, should be the first read. Or, I don't know, I think they need to do a sort of recalculation of how, you know, they're going through the reads just based on the amount of time Brock has. But well, let's, just call he doesn't, it, let's just call it like you see it. He doesn't look Brandon Ayuk's way He's not looking almost Ayuk's ever. Way. And Brandon's the only one who seems to be open ever. Ayuk is... And listen, I'm not saying it's huge separation, but he's getting open consistently against tough yeah. assignments. And like, it's there. And there's multiple plays where I see it. And Ayuk is like looking back and either there's a protection breakdown or Brock believes there's going to be a protection breakdown. And so he he scrambles and he, he either makes a play and he makes a lot of good scramble plays. Uh, also, their scramble drill is pathetic. It's awful. It's, it's Brock is it's, scrambling and no one yeah. is coming back to the ball or finding space. It's clear that no one's actually drilled them on a scramble drill. And I'm not going to put this on Leonard Hang. I'm not putting this on anybody who's on the staff. I've never seen them work on scramble drill. We're there for I'm, – I'm not there every day, but I'm just thinking about any day I've ever been at 49ers practice. I've never seen it. I've never seen it. Because that's not how Kyle Shanahan operates. Problem is, his quarterback operates that way. His quarterback had a Freaky Friday situation with Russell Wilson at some point at Levi's Stadium a couple of years ago and stole all of his powers. And I'll say this about the Seattle Seahawks, man. Nobody runs the scramble drill better than them. Even today, they got that thing. Pete Carroll might be gone. Russ Wilson might be gone. But Tyler Lockett's still there. Maybe go get him because he knows how to separate. It's one thing to not separate when you're going up against man press at the line of scrimmage. Not a lot of guys do. You know, they put C.D. Lamb right. in the slot for a reason. I I get it. I get it. It's a whole other thing when none of these guys can separate after five, ten seconds of a play. And 
a there was a decent of... amount of zone yesterday from the Seahawks. They mixed it up a lot. And they should have stopped doing that because that's the only time the Niners moved. I mean, I, I'm sitting there just like, did they just run zone again? Because every time the zone was there, here's 15 for you. Uh, they, they cleaned them up against zone. And anytime it was man, they couldn't move the fucking football through the air. Now, that's not to say they couldn't move it on the ground, which they did. And they did very well, uh, even with three different running backs. Shout out Patrick Taylor, who I thought had a really wonderful game. They moved him into the game when they were in the red zone. I thought he did a nice job as a power back. And yeah. uh, and obviously, Garendo had one of the big plays of the game with the 76-yard run, of which he slid. I think I think Weather, Witherspoon caught him, but he also slowed down because he heard people on the sideline going, stop, stop. And yeah. so he slowed down. He, to me... He's not getting caught if he's like fully running that. Like he didn't, I like he got genuinely caught. But like, if he's just running full speed and and going and not second guessing that, that's a touchdown every time. It doesn't matter. I think you know setting up a field goal for an eight point game. Like, it, yeah, there was some weirdness there. But it's Seahawks forty nineers. Like that's going to happen. Seahawks had a touchdown call back off of a legal yeah. shift or holding something like that. Like, the, the final five minutes, yeah. six minutes of that game were abject chaos. I will say with Garendo, it yeah. feels like that was like a breakthrough for him. Not that he looked like great all game. Like he definitely looked, looked hesitant at points. Better. And that, you know where it was? It was that one run on the outside where he did the thing. He's wearing 31 like Raheem Mostert. You were the one that pointed it out first. At least I'm, I, I'm stolen valoring you um, okay. when I – when I when I mention it, but like that the, val- run, the valor is equally shared here. It, it, right. of, of any valor we have, it, it's communal. Appreciate that. Appreciate yeah. that. But like that one run where he stretch run right and it looks like there's nothing there. And then he yeah. got like five or six or seven. And most are used to do that all the time where he's just he's faster than everyone else to the boundary. And you're like, there's no space. And there's just that little bit of space on the tick marks on the yard tick marks on the sideline, and he just gets up and just that terrible run suddenly turns into six or seven yards. And I was like, that looks exactly like Mostert. And then he hits the hole full speed on that 76-yard run, and you're like, this kid's starting to get it. I talked to him this week, and he's like, yes, I'm being a little hesitant. I think, you know, I don't know why that is. We know, Isaac. We know, we know. And, and and, you know, and he's like, yeah, obviously, I think I'd be further along. I didn't miss a ton of training camp, obviously. Uh, but I also, and he hasn't been really used this way, but there was one play where Brock, really bad, bailed on the pocket for no reason again. And it's where he threw the side armor to Jennings that Jennings dropped. He, okay. he And there was like pressure coming from Mafe against Trent Williams. And and uh, he, he could have thrown to Jennings. He like had him, but he also could have thrown to Garendo. And Garendo is leaking out to the right. And I'm just saying, I asked Garendo about like, you know, you used at Louisville, like you had some plays where, you know, as a receiver, it sort of gets you in the open field and, and sort of opens it up, right? Like you have to yeah. think a little bit less when it's just a bubble screen or you just run, you read it quickly yeah. and you just go. I think, especially with like Mason and the shoulder thing, I think Mason will, we'll see how it goes, but like, I, I doubt they use him as much as they have been with the shoulder thing against Kansas City, we'll see. But I would like to see them get Garendo involved just on a little dump screen, swing pass. Like, yeah, I think he's going to be really good on those. And now that he's feeling it a little bit, that's something I'm intrigued by. Listen, uh, it, it was a hell of a run. And you could just see him get better and better as the game went along. It doesn't surprise me, and I honestly think it's a good call to go with Taylor in the red zone. Yep. He's a very sure-handed carrier of the football. You're not doing anything funky or fancy. Um, you know, the red zone success that they had yesterday was strictly Brock Purdy just saying, you're George Kittle, I'm going to throw you the ball. <laughs> right. And frankly, that's been the only red zone success they've had this season. That's five touchdowns on the year in the red zone for George Kittle. He has more receiving yards, more receptions, more touchdowns than anybody else in the red zone. And it's not just because he's already played his week six game. So they need to do that more with Ayuk. They need to do that more with Debo to whatever degree. They should do it with Jennings. I mean, yeah. you, you have, if you're going to throw it in the red zone, you're going to be in some bullshit shotgun. I, I, 
I, again, I, 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 know, yeah. I know that I sound like I'm complaining about analytics with the Giants or something when I'm like, yeah, they're this bullshit shack. But legitimately, you need to be in the system that your wide receivers can run. Yeah. And your wide receivers cannot functionally run a four wide, 10 personnel spread formation. Your quarterback likes it. Tough tits. And you know what's happening? Every time they have trips to the right, teams are just shutting it down completely in the red zone. It's happened multiple yeah. weeks in a row now where they just help totally on that agree. side. Brock looks to the right. There's nothing there. He has to throw up a one-on-one -on -one ball, either yeah. to Jennings or or Debo. Or may, like If he gets lucky, Kittle. But they're always taking Kittle out of the equation. And then when you look back to the other side, usually Ayuk's I either open or they've helped on him, and there's no one open. Like right. they just when they put all those guys out there, it actually makes it easier for defenses, in my opinion, because yeah. it condenses space for their wide receivers. They're all trying to operate in the same zone. Like I think it makes it harder. I think by putting five guys out there, you're stressing Purdy out, and he looks one way, and the defense is taking away that entire side of the field, and you go, okay, good luck. Mm -hmm. The real challenge with any red zone situation is it's just man to man and not necessarily in the actual defensive scheme, right? It's just who's a dude, who isn't. And they had the ultimate dude. They used to have two of them, but Debo's no longer at that caliber anymore. And Kyle, so much of his offensive play calling is reactionary or building upon something that happened five plays ago or 15 plays ago where, oh, they did this when I showed them this, so I'm going to do this so that they do that, and then I'm going to hit them with that. And it's all you know I know that you know that I know. You, you don't pull that shit in the red. There's nothing like that in the red. You just have to draw right. cool shit. Unless you're and doing the weird – yeah, the, actually, you're, you're right. Right. You're you're just, this is where Ben Johnson thrives. It's why it, offensive coordinators that I don't think are that good – don't have any problem with scoring in the red zone because you're really kind of just doing it. It's, you're just tr trying to draw good shit and <laughs> you just hope that you have good players. And frankly, I don't think they called up a single good play in the red zone yesterday off of just one watch of the thing, but they got a dude, they got a couple dudes and it's on Purdy to really press that button as often as yeah. possible. They're lucky and that they have the quarterback to get away with it. And I think this week, as much as I've talked about Pearsall coming back on the fold, I think he and Ayuk actually need this because he, you, you said it, like he was not looking at the X because he had Pearsall a couple times, but Pearsall got hurt. And so he missed a lot of camp. So most of camp was like Chris Conley and right. sometimes Juwan and Juwan like winning on crazy catches. But like, again, yeah. not really separating all that often. A lot of cowing. A lot of, a lot of cowing. Right, right. And so... Why are you looking left? To You're me, done. I just see so many situations where it's like, dude, you've got all this attention going in this trip stack to the right. Like, look at your number one receiver. Make him the primary read. If it doesn't come off, who cares? But, like, how many touchdowns did Aaron Rodgers have in the end zone? Because he just threw it up to Devontae Adams. And I know, like, a lot of those are fades, and fades are not my favorite play. But I'm just saying there is something to every once in a while going, this is our best receiver. I'm going to trust that he wins on this and yeah. have one other read. And if it's not there, okay, it's a lost play. But Ayuk wins on these whip routes and these quick outs. Yeah. And they're just, they can't get to him because it either takes too long or he's not the primary read. I thought Brian Grubb called a really good game for the Seahawks yesterday. He just didn't have the better quarterback in the contest. He threw a couple of fades in the corner. Yeah. They were fine. They were, they were that they were uh, an right. inch away from scoring a touchdown before the end of the half. Uh, so many the of those of the were from Jigba. <laughs> so many almost Still. touchdowns with him. Still. I mean, that's just us being bitter because we have him on our yeah. fantasy teams. But uh, it's – it's he's a beast. By the way, he's he's built right. He's got wide-ass shoulders. He's a problem. He's a real problem. By the way, weird Geno game. He is uh, yeah, that, such an unpredictable quarterback where sometimes you're like, is he a – is Gino a top 10 quarterback? And then you watch him yesterday and you're like, oh, he doesn't know what he's doing. He, he cannot operate on any speed that's not his own. And the Niners, you know, I want to throw this your way. 
I've been thinking about this. I know it is hyperbolic to state that the Niners might be better without Charvarius Ward because he is a very, very good football player. But that's the concept of a Charvarius Ward, one that hasn't really existed for the 49ers this season. They are clearly prepared roster-wise to exist without him in 2025. Are they better off without him if he's never going to be 2023 Charvarius Ward? Are they better off without him today? Because Yadam had another disaster game. Okay, let's just lay it down there. But Green and Lenore were magnificent. Those can be top two corners. And then, I don't know, a Daryl Luter come on down. Uh, any other human Are you on saying the for the rest of the season or for next year? I'm just wondering if they should move Lenore back into the slot full time. Or if they should. It, it felt different with the pass coverage yesterday. And between Bosa and that pass coverage, whether it was Mustafa and Brown on the yeah. back end or whatever, but between that in, in sort of in a basic structure of defense, kind of the, the rush four drop seven that we've come to expect, in that Gino was unable to operate at his speed, right. his tempo, and felt rushed and frazzled throughout the contest and made boneheaded decisions. And I'm wondering how much you, Jake Hutchinson, attribute that to Charvarius Ward not being there. It's a good question. Maybe, I, that, I maybe missed, that's rude. I don't know. I missed some of Ward's worst games this season, you know? So it didn't get much better from week one. If yeah, no, honest. it was, it's not been good. Uh, I haven't seen him look like himself at all. And yeah. like Kittle seems fine from the core surgery, but remember, like he also had that core surgery and there's, I don't know. That's that can be a, a weird thing to come back from, and he might just. I, I sure more as hell time. wouldn't want one. Yeah, I. It's a good question, and I and I don't have like a. I don't think the Niners have the answer either, feeling. and I do think it would be ridiculous to come in and be like, "Oh, they're better off without him." But they had. It's worth asking the question though, because of yeah. what There's Green showed there. Yeah, and, I, and it's and I will say like Gino. You know, on that one play where he he got uh, the ball to DK, like if he could have looked to the right side, there's a coverage bust for a wide open Smith and Jigba touchdown. Yeah. Also later there's in the game, he missed a Walker on a, on yep, a wheel that's route. That's exact that one was... I was going to mention. Walker yeah, was wide open for a touchdown. Gino didn't uh, see him. Again. So I I want to like not get what is it getting okay, in the so snow. Like, let me let me throw let me throw this your way. Should the Niners put Ward in Yadam's spot? And let Renardo Green be CB one, maybe, and or, 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 or maybe on. not CB one, but, but I, th- I guess the real question is Yad- Yadam or Green, yeah. and I would probably go with Green uh, at this point. Me too, because um, that's really we gotta, what you, t- we, we gotta take our L on Yadam. He he can't keep up. He's with. he's had some good plays, and I think yeah. when he plays physical wide receivers and he can use that sideline to his advantage, he's great. But. He's a little too over eager, especially on crossing routes, and he hasn't played through the ball. He's had plays where he's been close, but he hasn't hasn't played through the ball that well. It's not like Akella Witherspoon, who, by the way, I saw one of the worst plays I've ever seen from a corner from him this That's last week. You should look it up. Yeah. It's all over Twitter, um, yeah. where it's it's triple coverage and Witherspoon, who's the guy that can easily make an interception, just like starts running the wrong direction and gives up. Basically, runs a pick on his own safety. Um, I'm not saying it's it's like that because because Yadam is at least mostly tracking the ball, but he's not playing through it where you can throw it up and the receivers got their eye on it and he doesn't. Yeah. And I don't. Yeah. He's been in the league for a while. Um, I don't know. I, I don't Listen, know about the, him. There's a, there's a, the, the Niners were able to get him and he had a uh, at least by PFF standards, a really good year last year. He looked really good in camp. Uh, I am starting to realize why that was. It's because he's a big physical corner, and the 49ers cannot handle big physical corners. The what the receivers can't. You know who can though? Like a bunch of other teams in the NFL who have little, you know, scat back guys out there wide and could just run right past you. What I, what I will say, 49ers are going to be able to have an actual real practice 
uh, before oh. this Chiefs game. I, I believe. Actually, as, yeah. I mean, unlike this. Well, I'm just saying, like in the regular season, they actually don't practice at all unless you have a bye week or this mm-hmm. where it's like a mini bye. I think they're going to have a real practice, which is why they waited for Pearsall um, yeah. because they wanted to get him in an actual practice and you don't get that in a normal week. Do like a I real think they should stuff. have their, I think they should have no preconceptions about their corner position. Mm-hmm. And I know having like an open competition in the middle of the season is kind of like uh, something that like fans sort of draw more than like teams. But I do think yeah. they should look at that position and say, all right, like who's actually performing, who's actually getting it. And when we're going to face the chiefs, like they still have Xavier worthy, right? He's alive. He's their only wide receiver who's remaining. He's very, he's very much alive. Yeah. So, if there was ever a good game to have cornerback questions, the Kansas City Chiefs coming to town. That's a weird sentence, but it's true. I mean, you're like, oh no, Juju Smith Schuster. Oh no, what are they going to do with? Uh, yeah. Who's the white guy? Watson. Yeah, Justin Watson. Yeah, yeah they, Justin. they've got a lot of, but it won't matter for them. Um. Yeah, I, I would just <laughs> say still, I think they're still going to win twenty four twenty three. Jake, don't get me wrong. No question. But like. But, like, the corner position, I do think they should have their eyes wide open. I think it sounds like Mustafa is going to be back, which is good. That's a huge win. I need to see more of that kid. He's just – you You guys all know how I stand on him. I was raving about him months you before the him. draft. Um, Jake, Jake, I have had at least one – no, okay, one. One, <laughs> reputable, one reputable person with at another one, team. One. Be like, well, you know, not everyone's going to, you know, cop to it. But I've had one person with a very reputable team tell me uh, to thank you for finding, for pointing out Mustafa. You, that was the first player you highlighted on draft day. Like that was that. Uh, we're talking like February. Like it, it, Super Bowl is over, and you're like, hey, have you heard about Malik Mustafa? And uh, yeah, there, there's a uh, there's another team in the NFC West that uh, was not up on Malik Mustafa's game, and then became up on Malik Mustafa's game, and you have a one in three chance of guessing who it was. So, um, because it wasn't the Niners, and he, you know, it, you brought up earlier, and it's interesting. The Niners did swap in fifty nine and fifty three. Yesterday, they let D winners get some run because uh, what's it going to hurt you? Uh, what, what could possibly happen that could be worse than what we Especially we've seen? when they're shut down, um, Walker. Totally. Totally. So, winters bring some juice. There's some positivity there, right? Like this team has, in a spiritual way, really missed Dre Greenlaw. Because Dre Greenlaw was out there looking to murder people. And yeah. That's a very important part of playing defense at a high level is having that like, oh God, they could kill someone energy. I, I really they actually like, want they actually want to kill someone while they're out on the field. Yeah. And like they say that, you know, they got the eye black saying or whatever, but like having someone who might be legitimately unwell out there really does, you know, force people to up their game to equally unwell levels. And we make a joke out of it. This is their livelihood. Like, it taps into something that can't be tapped into unless you got a straight up crazy man out there. And I love Dre Greenlaw as a person. He's the sweetest dude. Oh, he's yeah. He's a killer. He is a killer of yeah. the highest caliber. I don't think Mustafa or Winters is like that, but they play like their hair is on fire. And it really does matter. And it's really interesting. I had somebody tell me this a couple of months ago that you want to make sure your defense is young and your offense, if you have to be old somewhere, make it on offense because at least they're smart. Oh, shit, we have a team full of Tyler Lockett's. Like, sign me up. Right. Sounds great. I'll live with old on offense. I need young on defense because defense is all about feeling and reaction, and you need to have those synapses firing. And you can see it. I don't care how smart Devondre Campbell is. By all accounts, he knows the game better than anybody else. You and I know the game. We die. We die instantaneously out there. It doesn't Come matter on. what's going on up here. It matters what you can do with your corporal form. And he can't get it done yeah. with his corporal go form. Back right. to, uh, go back to last week when you talk about it mattering. And Mustafa had that insane came downhill. And I forget who it was, but he cr- I think it was maybe McBride. And he yeah. crushed somebody. Oh, yes. And 
Yes. And you and you watched I watched Nick Bosa from like 15 yards away go, oh my God. <laughs> and then he yeah. and he goes, Mustafa's like turned around, getting ready for the next play. He's like, no, 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 come here. He and he's like, he basically like pats him on the shoulder. He's like, that was incredible. And then Bosa yeah. goes, like Bosa made sure he was like, no, 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 you have to know that's insane. That yeah. matters. That stuff matters. And yes, you, you got to be able to put it out all on the line. Um, is there anything else juice. you want to get to well, before we get out of here? Shit, we can talk about juice. I, uh, I'm happy that they're using the fullback more. Uh, again, I'll go back to what I said earlier. I want to see 21 personnel and 12 personnel. And shit, I want to see some 22 personnel. But I, I don't want to see any more three wide receiver sets unless it's third down. And I sure as shit don't want to see any four wide receiver sets anymore. It, I, I, again, yep. I do feel like I'm tapping in to make the 49ers great again energy here and i'm trying to push back on that but ultimately it doesn't matter how good your quarterback is and clearly brock purdy is capable of doing all things in all areas he's awesome he's really really good you have to run the scheme that your offense can run not your quarterback your offense can run and this offensive line was built to outside zone block this running back was built, was brought in because he could outside zone run. Whether I'm talking about Garendo yep. or Mason, you make the choice. And these wide receivers were brought in because they could make things happen after the catch against zone or effectively run their routes and maybe make something happen, but probably right. not, with, yeah. in play action situations. The offense was built to run Kyle Shanahan's offense, even if the quarterback would prefer not to. And I'm glad whether it was through necessity or revelation, I'm glad that they got back to doing it. Because by the way, once you have this, once you get back to that baseline, hey, we can stack something on it here or there or anywhere. You can do some funky stuff off of it. But they they had been searching for the baseline consistently since week one. And I think they got it back. I'm in Seattle, you. and now they got 10 days to worry about it. And by the way, you better have that baseline locked in because as I'm with you. wonky as Kansas City seems, come on now, we all know. I'm with you. I think this is setting up for a situation where you get a little bit of rest. You are whatever, you're three and three, but you're in it. You're in it, you're and fine. it doesn't matter. In the NFC, and the rest, you're golden. You're basically resetting the season right from now. This is, this yep. is basically a mini buy before the start of the season. You're opening the season with Kansas City. Yep. What can you figure out? And maybe you throw a little Ricky Pierce all in there because I believe he, I believe Kansas City is the reason they drafted him in the first place. And I Good know call. they said, I don't know if we'll have enough time to get him ready. I really think you got to put him out there. Get that motherfucker if in he's there. ready. If uh, he's ready. If he's ready. If he's ready. Of course, you know, with yeah. just strict, strict football monkey brains. Yes. If yeah. he's, you know, if he can play, play him. And, yeah. uh, and use him to his full effect. I do want to give a shout-out, though. Uh, you know, the 49ers had a true must-win game yesterday. I know that oh, it wasn't technically – fuck that. They lose that game. It's done. It's over. It's, over, it's kaput. <laughs> because, by the way, Kansas City's coming in off a full buy. Oh, we got this mini buy. Kansas City's doing whatever the hell they want right now. And Andy Reid, I believe, has six losses ever coming off a buy. I think he's 32-6 and six off a buy in his career, including really? playoffs and a Super Bowl. So he might be good at this thing. Uh, yep. But to, to go in and amid all the weirdness and all the injuries and all the – I'm not talking just about the season. I'm talking about the game itself. As weird as everything was yesterday for them to leave with a win that was emphatic, at least in the score line, man, that, that's impressive. And it gives you every you. reason to believe that as probably disappointing as this might be in the long run – from what the initial standard was, because they don't look like world beaters right now, and that's what people were expecting. They still got a shot to figure it they out. They can get there, and they've done it in 2021, 2022. Give them time. Mm -hmm. They made sure that you can't count them out yet. That's where we're at. That matters. Don't count yep. us out either. We'll do it from Utah. We'll do it from anywhere, baby. That's right, folks. Appreciate you. All right. Bye.